Greetings, everyone. Or as uh, dear Alexander would say, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where in the world each of us is today. My name is Claire, and on behalf of today's presenters, our tech team and the 2025 coordination group, I welcome you to today's Gemini Solar Festival Conference. Gemini, with its secondary focus on love, wisdom, and love and goodwill in action, is the culmination of the three major spiritual festivals of the year. It is a sign of duality and the path to unity. Today's conference is an opportunity for us to consider our year's theme in more depth, radiating the living life of the soul, grounding the real. Each of our speakers will explore a different aspect of this statement. So we have a very full and we hope and trust a stimulating program today. So I will keep my introduction to a minimum. I just want to say very briefly and also as a way to place myself on the map of our group circle, because I really love the image of our lights coming on all around the globe when we meet together. Um, I live in Dunedin, which is a small university city on the eastern coast of New Zealand's South Island. Right now, we're experiencing our first really cold snap of the winter. I spent several hours in my garden yesterday, raking up the last of the fallen leaves and hauling and stacking firewood before the rain came bucketing down. Back in the house, the music I'd been listening to earlier on YouTube had flipped over to a different channel, as it does, and I found myself suddenly in a room with Sound's true host, Tammy Simon. Tammy was in a conversation with Ram Dass and Eckhart Tolle. She was summarizing something Eckhart had said in his book, The Power of Now. What she said was this, I would ask those of you who are here to listen with the ear of the heart and to listen not only to the words spoken today, but to the spaces between those words. It is said that when we listen with the ear of the heart, we tune in to that which is most essential. It seemed those words had arrived as a gift to bring into today's group process. As always, our intention is to work together to create a safe space for sharing of ideas, questions and concerns, ideas and insights. So please be encouraged to contribute to the group discussions today and to share your perspectives. Together we'll stand in the heart. All of us will benefit. Please also be assured that your listening is a vital and valued contribution too. So to begin today, Wendy, who is in Montreal, will lead us in an alignment. Hello, everyone. We will begin with an alignment. And let us begin our alignment by first creating an alignment of our personality bodies. Let us become physically relaxed and as comfortable as possible. Allow your breathing to relax and to deepen. Observe your emotional body and allow it to become calm and serene. And then take this moment to clear the mind of all thoughts, but remain mentally poised and alert as we move further into the alignment. Let us now bring the focus of our consciousness up to the Ajna Center, located just in front of the forehead.
and let us visualize, visualize the physical body, the emotional body, and the mental body coming gradually together as a single integrated unit within the Ashna Center. And this will create the integrated personality. Let us take a moment to acknowledge that we are each a soul. And we can do this by saying the following mantra with a sense of deep commitment. I am soul, soul am I. I am soul, soul am I. And as a soul, let each of us extend our identification to the group of world servers. Identified as conscious members of the group of world servers, we now project a line of light towards the spiritual hierarchy of the planet. The planetary heart is the spiritual hierarchy. And we visualize this line of light reaching the ashram of the masters. And also reaching towards the Christ at the heart of the hierarchy. And we extend this alignment to that great center within the planetary life where the will of God for our planet is known. Shambhala. Now, maintaining this deep inner alignment, we bring our focus back to the 2025 initiative group as we open to today's webinar during this full moon of Gemini.
and together we prepare to participate in today's work. for the alignment for the Gemini full moon webinar. Thank you, Wendy. You're welcome. Thank you. Alexander will now give us a quick run through of the day's um, structure. Um, there will be a fair amount of things happening and um, he will just clarify the order of the day for us, um, Sasha. Hello everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today, coming as a group. I want to share with you the purpose of uh, this gathering as we see it. As you know, the Gemini Fun is the time when Christ stands in front of the hierarchy, spiritual hierarchy of the planet, transmitting the impulse that he received during the Vesak from Buddha. And this time around the Gemini full moon, he transmits this impulse to the hierarchy and further to humanity. And so we use the opportunity of this conference, of this gathering, to come together to align with the hierarchy standing on its periphery and align with the World Service Group in preparation for this transmission of the will energy impulse the 2025 initiative experiments uh, with opportunities of cycles and first of all astrological cycles and as we now stand under the light of gemini we come into the alignment with the energy of Sagittarius, linking these two opposite signs that have unique qualities and unique role for our planet as uh, is said in the esoteric astrology, as uh, those are the only two signs that rule by planet Earth. And so in a way, we see this conference today as a Gemini Sagittarius conference because our topics today uh, and our conversations today will continue the conversation and the sharing that began six months ago during the Sagittarius full moon gathering of the speakers who presented in the past uh, at the 2025 initiative webinars. We, back then, we invited uh, them to reflect on the plan and meditate on the plan and come together and share their vision. We believe that no one has a, a monopoly on the vision of the plan, but if we bring together our pieces of understanding, weaving them together, we can get much broader vision of the plan. And so that sharing became the foundation for the year program of the 2025 initiative so the topic of this conference is the focus of the year for the 2025 initiative radiating the living light of the soul grounding the real that's the essence of that sharing that the collective group of speakers precipitated back then and today we invite us all to reflect on aspects of this topic three main aspects, how we can assist externalization of the hierarchy, how we as members of the World Service Group participate in the 
process of telepathic integration of the global group of world servers. And finally, what and how we do to assist manifesting the plan. So those are our main focus for today. And we will use the opportunity of Gemini full moon to radiate those topic, topics. The same as we focused in Sagittarius on the plan in Gemini, we radiate them to humanity. One more important aspect of uh, opportunities that given to us by the astrological cycles is that unique position that Gemini takes uh, in any oppositions of astrological signs where Gemini stands at the third point in a triangle. So as we share today and meditate today, we can bring our focus, lift our focus above the any oppositions. Focusing on the higher vision. And that's the gift that we can share with the world. So in the first part of our conference, we invite our panelists to share on the three main uh, topics. Then we will have a panelist reflection where each of them will uh, contribute their understanding of the broader scope of the topics and give feedback to each other. Then we will have a short break uh, that will be after our and a half of the conference. And then we will go to breakout sessions using a different platform, Zoom. Um, and I will uh, speak about that uh, more before we go to breakout sessions, given uh, instructions how we do that. And after breakout sessions, we reintegrate together again, and we share what's been shared in the smaller groups. And then uh, Dot Maver will lead us in meditation. So let's begin. Over to you, Claire. Thank you, Alexander. So today's um, our first speakers are Nancy Seifer and Martin Buick. And the title of their shared presentation is Assisting with the Externalization of the Hierarchy. So just to give you a little bit of bio and background to Nancy and Martin. Nancy is the author of many publications relating to the spiritual path and the realities of discipleship, including Disciples in the Year 2025. She is also a founder of the Living Discipleship Initiative, dedicated to furthering the approach between humanity and the hierarchy, pivotal to the emerging new era. Nancy has also been involved in experimental group work, focused on actualizing the shift into soul identity. She is the co-author of When the Soul Awakens, The Path to Spiritual Evolution and a New World Era, along with her husband, Martin Buick. Martin has been a student of the Ageless Wisdom teachings for over 40 years. In 2008, he and Nancy co-founded WhenTheSoulAwakens.org, an online wisdom exchange that attracts visitors from nearly 90 countries. In his early years on the path, Martin pursued a wide range of spiritual teachings and practices, from Ernst Holmes' Science of Mind to Edgar Cayce's Search for God. In 1981, he joined the staff of Lucius Trust in New York, where he served for nine years as focalizer for the Triangles and Esoteric Triangles meditation work. Martin is currently engaged in advanced study on the will and the Antikarana within the School of Esoteric Studies in Asheville, North Carolina. Welcome, Nancy and Martin. Thank you, Claire, and thank you, Sasha, and thank you to the 2025 initiative for hosting this event and for sounding so many notes of inspiration in your statement, radiating the light, the living light of the soul. 
It seems to have become our shared mandate to embody the light and love of the soul, to learn to live consciously as souls as we play our part in the plan. The subject of our role in the externalization is a big one, obviously, and since the time is so short, I would like to make three simple points, and then Martin will add his own. My comments will be based on the teachings of Master DK, along with teachings transmitted telepathically to an experimental group I am part of, and plus the, the experience of this group in applying the teachings. Point number one, the hierarchy has intended disciples to become active agents in the externalization. The externalization and the reappearance of the Christ will not just happen to us and for us. Some esoteric students are awaiting a hierarchical decision to be made in 2025, not realizing that this decision will depend upon the readiness of humanity. Not only men and women of goodwill, whose numbers are increasing, and not only the new group of world servers, which is rapidly growing, but also, and importantly, upon the readiness of committed disciples. It is intended that disciples become the conscious link in the great chain of planetary life uh, that has been missing until now. I, I really appreciate this painting by Daniel Goldstein that you see on your screen now called The Great Chain of Being because so much is expressed through it, including the very tenuous link between the, the upper half and, and the lower half. We need to strengthen that, become that link and strengthen it. Our task is to become active strands in the group onto Karana between the fourth and fifth kingdoms. We can achieve this through many disciplines, but ultimately by shifting into soul identity and expressing the love aspect of the soul. In virtually all teachings, it is said that the heart forges our relationship with the hierarchy, the planetary heart center. And the opening of the heart allows us to experience the grace and power of soul love in groups of disciples, where the flow of love can be strengthened in service to the hierarchy. Obviously, this is not easy work. We have existed as separate personalities for over 18 million years. But this shift in identity from personality to soul is essential to building the Antikarana and serving the plan. Master DK makes it clear that the next approach from the spiritual kingdom to humanity must be reciprocal. In previous ages, the great ones issued forth from the inner planes and sowed the seeds of new religions among us. But now, for the first time in planetary evolution, the hierarchy's approach depends upon mutual effort by humanity. For disciples, this entails self-purification and alignment, raising the vibrational frequency of our vehicles to achieve the resonance with the fifth kingdom that makes spiritual impression possible. Point number two, reappearance of the Christ will be a collaborative process. As we know, the Christ will not return alone, but with members of his ashram, masters, initiates, and senior disciples. But this event is to be preceded by a collaborative process involving the fourth kingdom. The soil for the reappearance must be prepared by those who know about these events, who are consciously working toward them, and who can recognize the masters and the Christ as they emerge into visible form. There are many ways in which disciples can serve in these times. For example, as each of us learns to express the love of the soul, we make it easier for others to do so. The same with facing the dweller. 
creating a foundation of spiritual love and support of healing karmic wounds can accelerate our capacity to serve. But there is one very specific way in which DK called on disciples to serve the unfolding plan. And that is by teaching three essential truths about spiritual reality. The reality of the soul, the kingdom of souls, and the evolutionary plan. One way this can be done is through logic. For example, it can be explained that the soul evolves through lifetimes eventually discovering the path, and that by treading the path, the soul masters the human experience and enters the kingdom of souls, the spiritual hierarchy, whose members are the custodians of the plan. But this work can be done more convincingly as a result of inner experience. And for this, it is essential to realize that encountering the living reality of our elders in subtle dimensions is a fact of life on the discipleship path. It should not be dismissed as a glamour. Once the required purifying tests are undergone, it is inevitable to come in touch with higher beings who guide and illumine our way. In fact, this is what makes possible the intelligent collaboration between the fourth and fifth kingdoms to which DK's teachings were devoted and which is critical to the Christ reappearance and the birth of a new civilization. Point number three, we can best serve by teaching what we know to be true inwardly. We are told that at this time, disciples can best serve by teaching what we know about DK's three recognitions from the heart of experience, not from texts, but by radiating the soul's light and love, whether in writing or in speaking. Master DK said that the three recognitions, as he called them, the three truths, must be assimilated by humanity to the degree that these recognitions will produce, will quote, here's an exact quote, will produce fundamental changes in human thought, awareness, and direction. And this must occur by 2025 to avert total disaster. To grasp the importance of this work, we only have to imagine what the world would be like if even a small portion of humanity had assimilated the truth that we are souls incarnate on earth to learn from experience and to distill spiritual light so that we can create a new world. Think of the present state of our world for a moment and imagine how different it would be if people had a glimmer of the reality that there is a higher law, a higher kingdom, and a plan for the evolution of our race. Imagine all the suffering that could have been avoided. And yet, in recent times, we are seeing elements of the plan ripple forth into human awareness. A stunning example occurred a week ago at the royal wedding, particularly through the sermon given by the Anglican bishop. He spoke about the power of love to make of this old world a new world, quoting Martin Luther King. For those who missed it, here are a few lines Bishop Curry spoke near the end of his sermon to an estimated audience of two billion people. Think and imagine a world where love is the way. Imagine our homes and families where love is the way. Imagine neighborhoods and communities where love is the way. When love is the way, then no child will go to bed hungry in this world ever again. When love is the way, the earth will be a sanctuary. Because when love is the way, we actually treat each other like we are a family. When love is the way, 
we know that God is the source of us all, and we are brothers and sisters, children of God. My brothers and sisters, that is a new heaven, a new earth, a new world, and a new human family. End of quote. It has been said that the Christ will reappear when there is a welcoming vibration on earth sufficient to provide an environment in which he can work. The response to Bishop Curry's sermon from around the world suggests that we are well on the way to the birth in Bethlehem. The fire of love in the human heart is spreading. What is needed is the recognition that a plan is working out in spite of the forces of destruction and that the planners are our elder brothers in the kingdom of souls those who have gone before us on the path and are awaiting our cooperation in their manifestation. Thank you. And now Martin will share his thoughts. Thank you very much, Nancy. Hello, everyone. I'm going to begin with a quotation from Externalization of the Hierarchy describing the Festival of Goodwill. The Festival of Goodwill is the festival of the spirit of humanity, aspiring towards God, seeking conformity with the will of God and dedicated to the expression of right human relations. It is a day whereon the spiritual and the divine, the spiritual and divine nature of humankind will be recognized. These are familiar words which have recently taken on new meaning for me after reading carefully a section in The Rays and the Initiations where the Tibetan discusses the energies available at the time of the June full moon. He begins his discussion of Rule 4 for groups preparing for initiation with these words. At the time of the June full moon each year, the love of God, the spiritual essence of solar fire, reaches its highest point of expression. This it achieves through the instrumentality of the hierarchy, that great group of souls which has ever been the custodian of the principle of light, of enlightened love, and when, which always down the ages focuses its attention upon the race of men when the spiritual influence is at its height. The Tibetan goes on to say that at the June full moon in 1943, the outpouring of divine love upon the planet reached, quote, time. Now this is extraordinary when you consider that a year earlier, in 1942, in the midst of the World War, the evil forces were so close to success that, quote, members of the spiritual hierarchy arranged to withdraw from human contact for an indefinite period, which would have meant forsaking plans to blend and fuse the hierarchy and humanity, thus putting off to a later time the inauguration of the kingdom of God on earth. In one year, 1942, the forces of light were near defeat. In the next year, 1943, the planet experienced the greatest outpouring of love in the history of the world through the agency of the Christ at the Gemini full moon. Two years later, the great war came to an end in 1945. The message rings loud and clear. Do not give up. And this same message applies to us today as we celebrate the Gemini full moon in 2018. Do not give up hope. Christ is returning to earth because he has a dual role to play and he has not yet completed his mission. In his Gemini full moon message in 1943, the Tibetan tells us that Christ has a double destiny. He has 
two distinct roles to perform in the unfolding plan as God's savior and God preserver. As savior, Christ came to earth as a representative of hierarchy 2,000 years ago at the start of the age of Pisces. This part of his dual task he could do alone. As server or God preserver, Christ has decided to return as the head of the new group of world servers. This part of his mission he cannot do alone. As we shall see, Christ needs the help of world servers everywhere to complete his task, as well as the help of the Lord Buddha himself. As we are told in the reappearance of the Christ, Christ has chosen to return to visible presence on earth as soon as possible. He reached this point of decision in 1945 as a full expression of divine will. As it says in the text, under the divine will, he had to appear on earth in visible presence. He had to preside over the materialization of the kingdom of God on earth. And he had to reinstitute the mysteries of initiation in such a form that they would prove the basis of the new world religion. Above all, he had to reveal the nature of the will of God. So it is that Christ, with whom we celebrate this festival of goodwill each year, is one who has chosen to fulfill his divine destiny. At a crucial time in history, he has chosen to return of his own free will as head of the new group of world servers the worldwide group of which we are a vital part. In the rays and the, the initiations, we read, his second opportunity comes as representative both of humanity and the hierarchy. He comes to relate them both to Shambhala. This he does through a great act of evocation seeking to bring about a closer relationship between all three planetary centers, Shambhala, the hierarchy, and humanity. He can do this because the development of the wisdom aspect in his nature makes it possible. The major linking agent in the universe is the energy of love, wisdom. Love relates the hierarchy to humanity, and wisdom relates the hierarchy to Shambhala. Only when humanity and the hierarchy are working together in a practical synthesis can the Shambhala energy be permitted complete inflow through the medium of the two other centers. To aid this process of gradual perfecting the help of the Buddha must be invoked and accepted. The fact is, the Christ with whom we cooperate each year at the Festival of Goodwill is the resurrected Christ, who stands with the human family in the fire of love and wisdom, invoking the will divine as the living representative of both hierarchy and humanity. He is the living demonstration on earth of God expressed through hierarchy and humanity. He is the God-man, the savior and the preserver of humankind. Understanding this basic truth gives depth and meaning to the festival, the festival of goodwill. And the very words used to describe this festival during, uh, further deepen this understanding. The Tibetan master uses both the word spiritual and the word divine to convey the full scope of the energies involved. 
as was stated above, the June Festival of Goodwill is, quote, a day whereon the spiritual and the divine, the spiritual and the divine nature of humankind is recognized. In the Ageless Wisdom, the word spiritual refers most often to the kingdom of souls, the fifth kingdom, the hierarchy, where the Christ and the masters of love and wisdom dwell. It is the abode of light. The word divine, on the other hand, refers to the center where the will of God is known, the center of life for the planet, Shambhala. Thus we see that both of these planetary centers are alluded to in this one sentence, as is the third major center, humankind. It is the divine privilege and destiny of the Christ who is returning to oversee the new group of world servers, to inaugurate the new era, to bridge between these three centers of intelligence, love, wisdom, and will. It is our privilege and our destiny if we choose to accept it, to work with Christ to become a living link in the great chain of being over which he presides. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin and Nancy. Lots to ponder. At the end of each um, presentation, we'll have a moment's quiet um, just to allow the words and content to land. I would like to invite Dr. Maver um, to speak. Just a, a brief introduction to Dot, who most of you know. Dot, it's wonderful to have you here. Um, Dot is an educator and a peace builder whose keynote is inspiring cooperation on behalf of the common good. Her service is in education, politics, and grassroots community. Um, organizing and is focused on creating and sustaining the conditions for a culture of peace, living in right relationship with self, others and all of life. The subject of Dot's presentation today is telepathic integration of the World Service Group. Dot, welcome. Mm, thank you, Claire. And thank you, 2025 initiative and Thank you all of us who have chosen to be together so intentionally at this moment in time. When Alexander initially invited this sharing on telepathic infrastructure, it seemed both timely and daunting. And as Nancy and Martin just made very clear, we are called upon to intentionally collaborate with the spiritual hierarchy. 
so as we look at all that we are aware of on this beautiful planet in our network of world servers, this sharing becomes a puzzle taking shape in a timely fashion as we radiate the living light of the soul, grounding the real. All that is, is ever present. We are simply and profoundly constantly awakening to what is already present. Expansion of consciousness is the ongoing gift of walking the spiritual path. Our tendency is to focus on out here, a lot of, if not most of the time, our personal conditions, many of our faults, the faults of others, how the system or society we live in is not working. Our aim is to become ever more cognizant of the world of energies in order to ground the real, to live on purpose, to spiritualize matter, to demonstrate living discipleship. The key, love more. However, before we go there, let's paint a picture of what we know. The entire story of telepathic infrastructure can be summed up as the science of contact. And this plays out in three distinct ways. First, the science of impression, which might be regarded as the fundamental science of consciousness. The human kingdom has a beautiful role to play as a magnetic receiver and distributor of the real. Second, the science of invocation and evocation. Always we get what we invoke. And for, for us as a group, there is the possibility of serving at a point of both invocation and evocation. In telepathy, we read, it might be said that the entire human kingdom will eventually be a major magnetic center upon our planet invoking all the higher kingdoms upon the formless planes and evoking all the lower or subhuman kingdoms upon the planes of form. Humankind is the macrocosm for the microcosm of the lower kingdoms in nature. This is the goal of all human service. Wow. Third, the science of telepathy and we know that this science ranges from instinctual telepathic communication to intu intuitional telepathy. So simplicity is key regarding us as a group developing a conscious telepathic infrastructure to offer in service, to realize the subjective reality, to see and to seize this opportunity for service. Again from telepathy, Every form has its own area of awareness, and evolution is the process whereby forms respond to contact, react to impact, and pass on to greater development, usefulness, and effectiveness. So let's act as if we are telepathically attuned with the ashram, which already has an etheric presence in community. Our etheric bodies need to be so sensitive that this becomes our identity. Thus, we witness that presence in every moment. In order for us, a group of world servers, to effectively provide a conscious field of contact and for us to react to the impact and intentionally transmit and distribute the impressions received, thus serving as an etheric communication vehicle and effectively grounding the real, we must consider three requisites. One, take personal responsibility. It is up to each one of us to do our own work physically, emotionally, mentally, thus offering our clearest impersonal loving selves to the group infrastructure and onto Karana. Two, a willingness to serve in group without personal agenda. The only agenda is the shared purpose to prepare for the reappearance of the Christ. Three, love more. 
love is pure reason leading to right action and right relations. Perhaps the greatest challenge we face is that the premier qualification of this field, this telepathic infrastructure, in order for it to be effective, is that the infrastructure must be conditioned by love. Yes, love. We could subtext this sharing, love more and with enthusiasm. For the love of the soul sweeping through our group, even right now, is a regenerating force. Take just a moment and feel it as our hearts unite across distance. As our group field, our etheric body provides a bridge for the fourth and fifth kingdoms. We know that the group of world servers is the linking bridge between the spiritual hierarchy and humanity. We know that Shambhala, the center where the will of God is known, impresses hierarchy. And we know that there is a mass of will to good available to humanity if, if it will be invoked. Thus, we face a challenge together. Do we have the capacity to unwaveringly, lovingly, and without reservation serve together in telepathic infrastructure? Thus, evoking from hierarchy the will to good and providing a means for grounding the real throughout humanity, thus creating another invocative call to the subhuman kingdoms, evoking conscious evolution through form? I vote yes. We not only have the capacity, we are demonstrating our proclivity through conferences, webinars, telepathic communication, shared resources, and so much more. As we know, part of our job is to offset the evil that has been wrought through misinterpretation of hierarchical impression. Again, we are called to ground the real, and we can be certain that if we are willing to love one another, regardless of our faults and failings, we will surely provide a lighted infrastructure that can receive and transmit and distribute without distortion aligned with the reality of the divine plan. In other words, we fulfill the purpose of spiritualizing matter and assisting with the distribution of the energies available to humanity at any given moment in time. We can also be certain that we will foster right relationship. In fact, we become a demonstration model. And in the spirit of peace, let's offer a definition. Peace is living in right relationship with self, others, and all life. As we ponder what it means to the group of world servers to live in right relationship, in telepathic harmony, providing a telepathic infrastructure, it behooves us to consider that our seven major centers become radiantly active, thus inspirational, not through meditation or study or a focus upon the centers. Rather, an entity becomes radiant as a result of the virtues, the virtues of right living, a high level of thinking, and loving activity. Only then do the centers become one center of light, not seven distinct centers. It seems a group of servers as an entity will benefit from this understanding and shared focus on right living, high level of thinking, and loving action in order for our radiatory influence to be effective as one telepathic field. Finally, we are a telepathic infrastructure and we can surmise that our telepathic infrastructure based on love and clear understanding of the need will help us apprehend the science of impression, thus helping all to understand invocation and evocation and the fact that right relations is beyond the human kingdom and includes superhuman and subhuman. At this moment in time, as Taurus has just entered Uranus for a seven year cycle, we deepen our understanding, commitment and group effort. The three topics today, assisting with the externalization of hierarchy, telepathic infrastructure and manifestation of the plan are a triangle of service in this regard. 
For whether we speak of an individual disciple, the world disciple humanity, or the three planetary centers, Shambhala, hierarchy, humanity, the science of impression is the process that establishes right relationship between and among. The technique of invocation and evocation is the how of what, so that the desired relationship is realized. The creative work of manifestation is the outcome. We are sensitive to the one in whom we live and move and have our being. What a joy! And this joy is realized together and as a group. May the spirit of peace be spread abroad in our hearts, through our group, and throughout the world. Om Shanti. Christy Dot, may the spirit of peace be spread abroad in our hearts, throughout our group, and throughout the world. Thank you. Our next speaker is Daniel Hutchison. Daniel was born in Zurich in Switzerland and grew up in Brighton, England, where he completed his formal education. Oh, he completed his formal education in London. Um, he obtained a BA honours degree in business studies before going on to become a chartered accountant. Daniel has worked for a major global IT corporation for the past 25 years in various finance leadership roles in various business divisions and covering a wide range of geographies. He has traveled extensively and worked for extended periods in Switzerland, France and South Africa. Daniel has been a student of the Arcane School since 2011. Today he will be sharing his thoughts on the manifestation of the plan. Welcome Daniel. Uh, thank you Claire. Um... And thank you, Alex, for inviting me to talk today. It's, uh, it's a real great, um, real pleasure and joy to be here to share some thoughts with you uh, on the manifestation of the plan. When we think of the manifestation of the plan as far as it relates to humanity, there is a tendency to think of it in terms of uh, the allevi alleviation of poverty, the establishment of social and economic justice the eradication of racial and religious prejudice and the establishment of peace on earth. And of course, it is all of that, but as an esoteric group, we also recognize that these are just outer effects of a general evolutionary process of unification taking place in human consciousness. As this process of unification proceeds, there will be an increasing externalization or living demonstration of spiritual principles and expressed creativity on the physical plane. We do, however, have to recognize that while there are many individuals and groups who have the will to change and to take that next step towards a greater spirituality, there are also many powerful individuals and groups who are not ready for such a change 
and who are fiercely opposing the transformation that the influx of spiritual energy into the body of humanity is seeking to bring about. The result is the duality, conflict, and struggle that humanity is currently experiencing. Gemini is the major symbol of duality in the zodiac, mediating between the two allied brothers, Pollux and Caspar, or the soul and the personality. The rise and fall of civilizations and the growth and unfoldment of all cyclic manifestations are produced by the interplay between the two brothers. The interplay between the soul and man on the physical plane takes place in the etheric body with which Gemini is closely related. The etheric body is composed of interlocking and circulating lines of force emanating from one or other or from one or many of the seven planes or areas of consciousness of our planetary life. It is through the seven major centers in the etheric body that human consciousness is connected actually or potentially to the seven worlds or areas of consciousness in our planetary life. In general terms, one can say um, that the personality functions through the centers situated below the diaphragm in order to develop human consciousness in the lowest three worlds, the physical, emotional, and mental worlds, while the soul functions through the center situated above the diaphragm in order to develop human consciousness in the higher worlds of the spiritual triad. The Tibetan tells us that when the energy reaching the etheric body is not related to a particular center, then that center remains quiescent and unawakened. When it is related, and that center is sensitive to its impact, then that center becomes vibrant and receptive and develops as a controlling factor in the life of the man on the physical plane. We might therefore state that the struggle between the two brothers is for dominance over the etheric body, as the etheric body is primarily composed of the dominant energy or energies which the man, the group, the nation, or the world react in any particular time cycle or world period. The dominant energy to which humanity currently reacts is astral energy, as the consciousness of humanity is polarized in the astral body. This astral energy pours into the etheric body of humanity through the solar plexus center and is the dominant controlling factor in the life expression of humanity on the physical plane. The Tibetan goes on to say that as the attitude, attainment, and comprehension of man shifts to ever higher levels, he sees the etheric body will be constantly changing and responding to the new energies. These energies he will be willfully bringing in, and this is the right use of the word willful. And this statement indicates the way out of uh, astral consciousness, the way forward for humanity. During the process of transference of energy from the personality centers below the diaphragm to their higher counterparts above the diaphragm, the personality form becomes increasingly illumined or soul infused and the conscious dweller within is gradually liberated from the mental structures, emotional patterns and material attachments which he has developed over countless lives while operating unconsciously through his lower centers. All these patterns within the threefold personality form might be said to reflect the karmic le legacy which the human being brings into his current life, adjusted of course for any current life conditioning. As long as he blindly engages and shapes his environment in, in accordance with these habitual structures and patterns, he creates conflict and is governed by the karmic laws of cause and effect. Only by striving to live consciously or in presence is the spiritual aspirant able to break with the lower patterns which have hitherto governed his contact, con conduct. During meditation, he consciously breathes in the cosmic ethers and willfully brings these higher spiritual energy energies down into his etheric vehicle, where they then battle with the resident personality energies for control over the dense physical body. These battles are experienced as, experienced as crises in the life of the disciple, who consciously engages these crises in order to fit himself for greater service. He realizes that as he aligns himself with his older brother, his soul, and increasingly succeeds in creatively precipitating the ideas and spiritual principles of his soul through into his etheric body and into outer physical plane demonstration, he is fulfilling a tiny step in the manifestation of the plan. Spiritual aspirants often concern themselves a great deal with what they should 
do in terms of their outer activity or service, not being sufficiently aware that it is their inner governing principles and motivations which determine their outer conduct and whether they are serving or not. What should be a prime interest of the spiritual aspirant is the manifestation of the plan within his own system of manifestation, of uniting the inner and the outer brother so that the high principles of the inner brother can demonstrate through the activity of the outer brother. As he does this, his soul-infused personality field increasingly becomes an expression of light love and the right use of power, and he gradually prepares for the process of group fusion or the fusion of his field with the field of his service group. The goal of a group of disciples in outer manifestation who have succeeded somewhat in developing a loving synthesis within, this, within themselves is to manifest and create that same loving synthesis in the world, to aid some aspect of humanity, to strip away the illusion, glamour, and maya, collectively termed illusion, within which the soul of humanity is immersed, so that the two brothers are free to develop a loving interplay, and in that interplay, to learn how to proceed precipitate and express the unique creativity on the physical plane. One way in which we can view the struggle between the two brothers is in terms of perspective. The one brother has a global inclusive perspective based on love, which accepts and integrates, while the other bro brother has a local exclusive perspective based largely on fear, which rejects and separates. The challenge faced by the spiritual aspirant in the world today as he tries to unify the two brothers within himself is to achieve a balanced perspective between the global and the local and to learn to accept and integrate all that is local and unique into the global and universal. When this is in process of achievement, he gradually becomes group conscious and begins to serve the global purpose while operating through a local personality vehicle and honoring his local personality relationships as a soul. He then has a truer sense of proportion and is more easily able to weed out spurious need from true need. And when we speak of need, we are of course speaking about physical, emotional, mental and spiritual need. It is important to note that as true need is discerned, purpose emerges in consciousness. And as true need is met, purpose and hence the plan is fulfilled. The question we might therefore want to ask ourselves is whether we are able to clearly discern true need for growth and development from the false need for growth and development so prevalent within humanity today, bearing in mind that what we try, try, try to grow and develop is a question of orientation and what is truly needed is often quite different from what the personality thinks it is. As the individual, group, nation, and humanity as a whole journey onward, as we all act individually and collectively from moment to moment, rightly or wrongly, either meeting human need or failing to meet it, we either create destructive cycles in which need is largely defined in terms of fear and greed, leading to emotional reaction and karma, or constructive cycles where conscious loving response leads to the meeting of human need and the carrying forward of an aspect of the plan. We might say that the only thing that really distinguishes love from what we perceive as evil are the many layers of personality illusion. The more toxic the illusion, the greater the perceived evil. But no matter how evil the outer presentation of the personality, at the center of the human being is always the soul, pure love and peace. So the path to peace and harmony lies in the removal of the heavy burden of illusion, which is depressing the flow of life into humanity creating a sense of lack and fear, which leads to competition and conflict, as well as to general depression and diminished vitality. Only as the layers of illusion are lifted can peace and harmony, the true nature of man, be revealed. We see, therefore, that in order for the plan to manifest on the physical plane, there is a need to pierce the various layers of illusion surrounding the various groupings within humanity so that light can enter and reveal to the consciousness of these groupings the falsity which has been their reality, thereby enabling them to gradually discern a greater reality, a greater truth, and a greater purpose. It is evident that different groupings within humanity are subject to different types and grades of illusion, 
which is why there's a need for such a diversity of servers. Servers are most likely to be able to help with the illumination of those specific groupings with which they have the greatest resonance and where the particular path of illumination corresponds most closely with their own personal life experience or journey. To provide an example, many corporate entities within the world of business are conditioned by the idea that hierarchically imposed authority and control is the most expedient means of governing big business. Just as this corporate belief system has been conditioned by the aggressive, highly competitive global economic system in which the corporate system operates, so the personal system of the individual employee becomes conditioned by the way in which the corporate consciousness, brain and heart operate. Because the employee is a cell within that corporate body being nourished by the resources distributed by, distributed by the circulatory system of the heart and being informed of the ideas and governing principles by the corporate brain and nervous system. The general life and vitality of the plane of consciousness on which the corporate leadership team normally functions will not only control the corporate etheric body and hence the heart and brain of the physical system, it will also control the specialized energies around the originating idea and governing principles which gave rise to the physical birth of the corporate entity. Although the originating idea in the mind of a corporate leadership team is very rarely entirely illumined and aligned with the idea of the soul, it will often be far more illumined than what is actually being delivered on the physical plane. This is because the process of precipitation is not sufficiently well understood by the leadership team. There are often many blind spots in the corporate consciousness and there's often insufficient integration with the form and insufficient alignment with corporate purpose. Take, for example, the idea of the United States as an independent nation, as set forth in the Declaration of Independence and the US Constitution, and compare that to what is actually being delivered today under the Trump administration. So in order to manifest an idea, an aspect of the plan on the physical plane in its integrity, a gap in consciousness needs to be bridged in two directions. Firstly, between the idea as it exists in the soul and the idea as it has been interpreted by the mind. And secondly, between the idea in the mind and the delivery of that idea in physical reality. Bridging both gaps entails dispelling illusion. And as illusion is dispelled, consciousness becomes increasingly clarified and grounded in the soul. The individual or leadership team is then more easily able to precipitate an idea or principle through the mental and astral bodies and through whichever physical system it is seeking to manifest, manifest through. Be it, a, be it a piece of artwork through the physical system of an individual, an educational curriculum through a schooling system, or commercial product through a corporate system. Today, many lead, leaders acknowledge that the world systems do not meet true human need. They do not deliver a corporate purpose, let alone divine purpose. Where the governing entity of such a system has the will to change, an attuned server or group of servers can aid the individual or leadership team to bring greater illumination into that system. Simply by helping a leadership team to penetrate deeper into the originating idea brings a new light to the understanding and interpretation of that idea. This leads to a shift in consciousness which assists in bridging through to true soul intent. Then when a light is shone upon the gap between the corporate idea and what is actually being physically delivered, there is already a greater sensitization and readiness to acknowledge the dysfunctions in the existing system. This leads to new signals precipitating through to the physical brain and heart of the system, and hence to a corresponding change in the mode of operation, one which takes a distinct step forward and towards the manifestation of the plan within that corporate entity. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. So many very practical ways and um, tools for grounding the real from our personal lives right through to the corporate body and the, and, and the global group. Um, I was really struck by um, what you said about um, the importance of recognizing our habitual patterns and the inhibitions they impose on us and to establish through discernment um, constructive cycles um, governed not by fear, but by love. Thank you very much.
So we've reached the point at which we invite our four panelists to um, come together in conversation and reflect back amongst yourselves and with the group um, those key ideas that, that caught you and that you would like to share back, um, reflect back to each other and, and to us in the group. So Dr. Daniel, Nancy and Martin, uh, we will unmute you and invite you to begin our conversation. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all for such wonderful contributions. Mm. Well, I have a thought. This is Martin. Um, I was really struck by one sentence that uh, Dot quoted about we are meant to be both invokers and evokers. And uh, that is, I think, extremely important. I think that we are invoking the higher guides and teachers and energy, the, everything that we align with. But once we begin to shift identity and enter into the through into the periphery of the ashram and then be, begin to see ourselves as actual members of the kingdom of souls and ashramic workers then the role of an ashramic worker the role of a conscious soul is to evoke a living response from that which is below you on the chain of evolution so we are invoking trying to bring spiritual energies and divine energies down in through the chain of being into expression on earth but as our identity actually shifts from being a persona who's struggling to a soul and a member of the kingdom and a being of love and light then that love and light that we express is meant to be evocative of those on the path with us and the other kingdoms. So I really related to this idea that Dot expressed uh, about we are destined to be both evokers as well as invokers. Mm. Yeah, as you share that, Martin, the, the thread or a thread that ran through from Nancy through your sharing, which I love that you told us, do not give up hope awesome and the, the link of love wisdom as such a connector uh, that it really has to do with what Daniel was speaking of of these living principles expressed in that it's our spirit body that is the dominant energy and I and it I'm mindful at the same time that we are in this flow of Gemini that has to do with fluid synthesis so it, in loving synthesis uh, you know, and as Nancy, as you called forth, our point of identification as souls. So all of that plays, that those threads play through uh, our opportunity to be a, a radiatory point as a group and ground the real. Very good. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> So we very often see the physical as being the foundation, but in fact what you're saying is the etheric is the foundation upon which all else stands and is built and can grow in all directions. Yeah, and Daniel spoke a lot beautifully. Indeed. Absolutely. Um, hello everybody, I, this is Nancy speaking through Martin's Oh, sorry. I was muted. So <laughs> I'm using Martin's Lisa. Martin's uh, um, computer right now. Yes. Okay. I, hello. Uh, I wanted to say hello. Hi, Nancy. Wanted, we can hear you. Okay. Yeah. I wanted to say that. Um, yes, I agree with what was just said, and. The focus on the dweller, I think, is really key for us as we move through this time because by dealing with, 
by facing the dweller, and I think all of us mentioned it virtually, um, we then move into this uh, a closer identification with the etheric realm. That's what allows us to break through the person that through breaking by breaking through the personality patterns that constitute the dweller. We actually refine our bodies. And by that method, we then become impressible by the next kingdom, by our elders in the next kingdom. So I think that is key. And it's interesting that several of us talked about that. I just wanted to make that point. Thank you, Nancy. That was expressed by all of you in quite different ways. Um, um, da Daniel, just um, I love the the image of uniting the two brothers, um, mm -hmm. our inner and outer brothers, um, which is very much um, another expression of of our shadow work and how necessary it is for in order for us to become soul infused and effective agents of service to yes. engage consciously with that work. Mm. Yes, thank you. thank you, Claire. I'm going to go upstairs and um, can you unmute me? <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I think Daniela will be able to do that, yes. Thanks. Um, there was an echo between two of your computers, uh, so I had to mute one of you, Martin or Nancy. So. I'll, shut the, I'll shut the door. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, one of the things that I was struck by um, was something you said, Nancy, which was that the reappearance of the Christ is a collaborative process. She may and not be back online yet. Um, yes. Yeah, so do you want? Did you want me to comment on that? Yeah. I just found out. Yes. Yeah, just um. The, the, yes. Yes. Um. The idea of the collaborative process is so powerful, and I think we recognise that. Um, but it's really helpful to have it reaffirmed. And if you have anything more to say on that, that would be wonderful. Yes, um, I think it's a really key idea also that we move out of this state of sort of passive acceptance of events and um, the way in which the teachings of DK are usually interpreted to mean, uh, to be that, you know, these events are happening no matter what. Um, we know that human participation, participation of the fourth kingdom, especially those of us who have a consciousness of these things, is, is required because um, DK tells us that this is the time, this is the first time in the whole history of humanity and the planet when in order for the spiritual kingdom to reappear, there has to be a reciprocal approach, meaning that humanity has to participate. And those of us who know about the plan and who are um, awakened to the possibilities of discipleship, let's say, are especially called to be part of this. Um, and it is collaborative. The more we're aware of it, the more we join together in groups such as this, the more we become aware of the potential power of a group of disciples to play a role in in the plan. So I'm very glad that um, you brought that up. Yeah. yeah, I feel it's really important because it's um, extending an invitation to us all to be uh, per personally responsible um, and proactive in our um, service work and our love towards others. It's uh, not at all a passive thing. Yes, that's yeah, right. That's and um, I think, sorry. sorry, I was just going to say, I think Daniel mentioned that the work that we need to do on ourselves. Yes, that's that's a big part of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's uh, just just to just to highlight that it's it's really a continuous process. Um, there's nothing to wait for um, in order to act. It's just a continuous process that we need to go through um, to approach hierarchy and to allow um, that reappearance of of the Christ. And I think um, you know to 
balance to think of the plan as you know one event, major event that's happening, to think of it as a continuous step-by-step uh, -step approach um, to hierarchy, and that every little step takes us uh, forwards. But it's it's an infusion, um, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. In infused process. Yes. Thanks, Dan. Mm. Yeah, appreciate that comment, Daniel. It's a good reminder and. As we come together, as Nancy, as you were just saying, so intentionally together and as a group, uh, and we continue to experiment with various ways of doing that, uh, the more intentional we are, the more our group consciousness uh, holds that, that space and we identify as the group soul, which really puts us in a position to, to collaborate. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. Yeah, there's a sense of possibilities opening up even now as we're speaking in this moment of broader participation mm. and inspiration because we're having the same realizations of what's needed of how we have to transform ourselves in order to be really useful to the hierarchy right now. Yeah, what you were saying, Dot, about you know intention—that that is so important to to really be clear about what you're doing um, as a, as an individual and as a group, and and to be very conscious of that and uh, the outplay of that. Yeah. You know. One of the, go ahead. No, you go. No, you go ahead, Martin. Well, I was just going to mention that the group that uh, Nancy has uh, spoken about called Living, Disciple, Living Discipleship Initiative, we work with various seed thoughts. And I was struck by what Daniel was talking about, the elder brother and the younger brother, and then the concept of one must de decrease while the other increases. So I want to read the seed thought that we worked on recently just because it reduces everything to what we call mathematical law. So, this is uh, just a, a resonance or a synchronicity in terms of uh, the area of, that we're focusing on now. In the disciple's life, two things occur above all else. The waning import of the outer plane and the waxing of the inner realms of life. It is the path that both subtracts and adds, transforming by mathematical law, rendering the world new for the ages. Now, a whole group of people in different parts of the world have been reflecting on this as in, in addition to the traditional seed thoughts that we do, it expands our thinking and creates a magnetic um, thought form of solution. And I think that's going on very definitely in the world and we need to precipitate that and make it manifest in the world. Martin, could I invite you to read that again for us, please? Okay. Just so can, we can... In the disciple's life, two things occur above all else. The waning import of the outer plane, the waxing of the inner realms of life. It is the path that both subtracts and adds transforming by mathematical law, rendering the world new for the ages. Ponder on this. Mm. That's so powerful. Such a strong invocation. Thank you. Okay. I wonder if perhaps we can um, ask you to um, send us that I statement would. is something that we could actually take into our meditations in, in other ways beyond the conference. Sure. Thanks, Martin. One of the other things that um, stood out for me was the idea of um, Doc, you referred to our purest impersonal loving selves. 
offering our clearest and personal loving selves to the group infrastructure mm -hmm. in Atta Karana. And I found that also um, a very strong invitation. That, you know how we become both more personal and less, less personal as we become mm -hmm. increasingly soul infused in our, and um, active in the world um, in our service work. Could you say a little bit more about that possibly? The clearest mm -hmm. and personal loving. Yeah, I, I, I will say that along the journey, uh, as we become the observer and ever more sensitive uh, with the capacity to discern uh, choice by choice out here, it at the same time uh, allows for any of those places within ourselves, be it a place of judgment, a place of irritation, a place of uh, uh, mental, uh, I don't know what word exactly to use, that would be gently appropriate, but at any rate, those kinds of things also get exacerbated. And so for all of us to be at once aware of that as we are doing our own personal work and, and at the same time leave that at the door as we enter into an experience like this uh, for a couple of sacred hours together where we really show up as the loving impersonal self aware of our own and everyone else's whatever but that is not the point the point is that we can show up in our full-bodied soul infused loving wise selves to the best of our ability in a given moment that's the power of conscious collaboration that from my perspective will make the difference for us as a group of world servers in this moment in time. Thanks Dot. It reminds me of something I read recently um, uh, online. It was something Carolyn Liss said and she said choice is the greatest power we have and some say love is but we first have to choose to love and <laughs> one, one of the um, one of the mantras that I've found very helpful in my own life and doing my own shadow work and when the personality starts playing up is to stand in a place of um, recognition of the other soul and to say on the level of soul, I hold you in my heart. On the level of soul, mm -hmm. I hold you in my heart. And that mantra actually is a very powerful way to transform the personality's tricks and imperfections. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and to enable us to stand in a place of soul connection with with those we come into contact with. Yeah. Mm, beautiful. I'd just like to add that um, I think what we're seeing here today and also yesterday in, in the preparatory session where a number of us um, participating in the logistics and everything today who were, were together, we're seeing that um, how relatively easy it is to reinforce the love of the soul mm. through. Um, it's a concept before we're really involved intimately in group life, but when we become involved in groups, um, and we are shifting into soul identity and, and the heart is open and um, we're aware of who we are as the soul. It, it's really relatively easy to foster that. And that is, I believe, one of the most uh, important tools we have in bringing the, the plan into manifestation. Hmm. Um, it's a work that we can do together. We must do together. We can't do it apart from one another. And yet we know that it is the love of the soul that opens the gates to the hierarchy. So when we're talking about cooperation between the fourth and fifth kingdoms, which is essential to the plan, um, this is a key element of it. And it's not hard to do. Hmm. Love more. <laughs> and start yeah, love more. Dot, you said the wonderful one. <laughs> that was fantastic. Yeah, so simple and so clear. Love more. Mm. Yes, <laughs> why not? What is there to lose? Really, what is there to lose? Except our separate identities. 
isn't that the truth? And what a blessing that will ultimately be. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's the new era. That's the new civilization and the new culture. That's the heart. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, we know the keynotes of that and we say them and talk about them over and over and we know that one of them is is sharing and that I mean that comes through that deep place of recognizing that it really is about love one another. Mm -hmm. And by the way, okay. what foundation of love exists in a group? It's very, very possible to um, accelerate the way in which we deal with what remains of the dweller. Because yes. it's a mission that we all have remains of the dweller. That's just who we are. That's our long history through these eons. And when there is that loving support of a group, and we recognize and share, able to share because of trust, that we all have these things we're working on. Um, it's 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 like a, a a given, or it's like a an instrument available to us that we haven't been aware of. In other mm. words, on the foundation of love, we can all foster the processing of the dweller at much greater speed, and and form that sense of group consciousness, soul consciousness, that is so pivotal to the plan. Mm. Yeah, yes, you please say Oh, go ahead. Martin referred to that when he's, he spoke of um, custodians of enlightened love. And one can expand this as being loving custodians in these group, um, group containers of each other's learning. And um, yeah, just I love the idea of being loving custodians towards each other as mm -hmm. we learn and as we um, address, you know, our imperfections. We are all works in process, in progress. Um, yeah, but, you know, through the group work, we learn tolerance and patience and generosity of spirit and um, from there take those principles out into the world and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think um, allowing life to flow more naturally, because um, at the moment we live in a very um, artificially time-oriented uh, world, and so to to provide the time and space and opportunity for that unfoldment and for that sharing and for that trust, I think is is vitally important. So groups such as this, where you have that space, um, it's very important. You know, there's a connection between some of the things that Daniel was saying about Gemini governing the etheric and um, this whole idea of cooperation, um, which uh, is captured in a phrase E.K. says we don't really understand. And he basically says, in um, I think it's in um, the reappearance of Christ, he says life, which is the quality of the etheric body, life is the livingness which enables, and then you look down further and it's, he finishes it by saying, life is the livingness which enables cooperation. And he hints mm -hmm. that it operates on three levels. And I'm, I have um, worked this out into a little table I have in front of me. I'll show everybody later who comes to our little group. That's an enticement to come to our little group. Um, <laughs> physical life, livingness and life more abundantly are the three categories. And so he says, we're alive, the cells of the body are alive. And that means life is the livingness which enables cooperation on the physical level because we have etheric bodies and our auras blend and we interact and engage with one another and we are enabled to cooperate in the world of form. But as disciples, we move up to the level of the dual life of discipleship and the qualities are love and light with our heart. And he says, if there's love and light, in your heart and radiating from your heart, that is livingness. And that is demonstration that you are part of the inner kingdom of souls and part of, or at least on the periphery of an ashram. If you have love and light radiating from within your, within your heart, then life 
is the livingness which enables cooperation on that level, on that inner level of discipleship, on that level, the inner level of the world of meaning. And finally, he says, there's life more abundantly, which lifts from the heart to the energy within and above the head. And that is light and love, but also power. And now these are the true masters of wisdom and the arhats, and they are enabled to cooperate with the planet as a whole and those three centers that I mentioned, humanity, Hierarchy, and Shambhala, which are the etheric centers in the true form of our planetary logos. And so the masters of wisdom and the arhats are cooperating and are enabled to cooperate with all three centers. And the goal, or one of the major goals of the plan, is to make that circulation between the three centers a living reciprocal interchange and living reality and i'll tell you more about it when you come to the group thank you that brings us back to the theme which of uh, radiating the living light of the soul and grounding the real in ways that are palpable practical and um, um cooperative <laughs> <laughs> yes, so, yes. <laughs> so I'm, I'm just aware of our time. Thank you all. We've, um, we have 20 minutes for our, our reflectors, um, reflections um, um, session and we're going to move along now to Alexander who is going to give us a breakdown um, into how our group discussion period will work out and after that we'll have a 10 minute interval so that people can stretch their legs, make a cup of tea, um, sit a while with the material that's been brought forward this morning and then we'll reconvene and go into our um, groups after that.